Okay, I think we can get started now. Welcome to our test seminar today. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce um, Professor Craig Powell from the University of Auckland, um, who is teaching there since 2008 in zoology subjects such as adaptive form and function, animal behavior, and terrestrial animal biology. Um, Craig grew up in New South Wales and did his PhD and his postdoc at Macquarie University in Sydney. Um, he's a naturalist, um, zoologist, and behavioral ecologist uh, with taxonomic focus on um, terrestrial invertebrates. Um, his research interests range from predator prey interactions, the evolution of animal weaponry evolutionary ecology and um, of New Zealand's terrestrial invertebrates to the behavior and ecology of the praying mantis. Um, Greg is a strong advocate for research into poorly known invertebrate groups and for being guided by natural history as a starting point to test evolutionary hypotheses. Um, so uh, it's my great pleasure to um, introduce you and um, talk we are going to hear today is about sexual selection and morpholo morphological diversity among New Zealand invertebrates, um, where Craig is led by the fascination with the, or lets the fascination with the natural world set the agenda. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for that uh, lovely welcome. I think you've summed things up uh, nicely. And thank you so much for all being here. It's so lovely to be in a situation now where I can talk to some live people <laughs> rather than having entirely online kind of talks and situations like that. And I'm sure you guys are all feeling the same way. But um, hello also to those of you tuning in, um, tuning in from other campuses or elsewhere uh, online. Um, hopefully you can all hear me okay where we are. So um, I just got a lovely introduction to sort of where, where things are and the sort of theme for what I want to talk about today. But I also like to kind of get started and introduce myself um, in the way that we do in Aotearoa, New Zealand. So um, uh, ko Gariwa te maunga, ko Wimara te awa, uh, no Australia, aho. Ko Ironbark, Snengaheri, um, ko Greg Holwell, Taka Wingoa. So a little uh, mihi in Te Reo Māori. It's a normal sort of way to kind of introduce things and get things going in Aotearoa, New Zealand. And it's a, I really like having got in the habit of that because instead of providing kind of an academic um, introduction to me and where I'm from and things like that, it really kind of comes back to where I grew up and the landscape that I call my own. So um, my maunga, my mountain is Gariwood. Yes. I'm so sorry. Uh, one could speak a little louder, please, because it's a little hard to hear. But the second thing is, you just used a bunch of Maori words. I have no idea what you just said. I don't think anybody else did either. So can you just explain what it was that's significant what you just did? Yeah, that's what I'm about to go oh, on to and explain fine. right now. So yes, yep. no worries at all. Yep. So we can get there. <laughs> volume a little higher is that a little better for you can you hear all right now so i just don't want to kind of um want to make sure my voice holds out but uh if that's if you can catch that at the back that's great so yeah so what i just uh gave was a mihi which was a traditional um sort of introduction into raya uh and i introduced my maunga which is my mountain so this is gariwa this is the grampians national park near where i grew up and as well as being the kind of the predominant kind of feature on the horizon of the town that I grew up in, it's also where I really started my research career. I did my first honours project on kangaroo ecology in uh, the Grampians National Park. And my awa, which is my river, uh, is the Wimmera River, which runs not too far away from Stall, where I grew up. And uh, that's where I also continued my research career because I worked on platypus ecology, radio tracking platypus through the Wimmera River for a while there. And then probably the feature that really kind of dominates my feelings about um, where I'm from and who I am is the forest uh, woodland environment around where I grew up, my Ngaheri, uh, which is the box ironbark woodlands found through this part of uh, southeastern Australia. So this is the kind of woodland that I grew up in. So altogether, 
these sorts of landscape features are much more applicable when describing who I am and where I'm from than my academic journey. So I really like that process of going through a mihi like that. So growing up in this sort of environment, um, I couldn't help but be constantly encountering the wonderful Australian animal fauna around me. And uh, I was in love with it right from the beginning and became a naturalist right from early on. And just this fascination with the natural world has really kind of driven where I sort of set my career. I think I brought home a piece of writing when I was about six years old from school and told my parents that I wanted to be a zoologist. And so probably one of those rare people that's actually <laughs> continued on doing something that they wanted to do right from early on. So, Natural history, being in nature, getting inspiration from nature is really how I, how I define myself and how I define my career. And that kind of continued on nicely when I went into my PhD, because that brought me up here. So I did my PhD and postdocs through Macquarie University in Sydney, but all of my fieldwork, the majority of my time was spent in this part of the world. So in the, uh, in far north Queensland. So I worked on this amazing genus of praying mantis called Chilfina. Um, we have a mating pair of Chilfina rensi, named after David over here uh, on the left. Uh, that's over at Babinda, near Babinda boulders. On the right there, you might make out Hinchinbrook Island in the, uh, in the background, a nice uh, silhouette of another Chilfina on a, on a tree. Who's seen Chilfina around? You have awesome yeah there if you if you know what you're looking for you'll you'll see them there they're in the botanic gardens uh here in town they're in most rainforest environments around in the woodlands up on the tablelands as well um they if you haven't seen them don't be too concerned <laughs> that's probably because they've seen you first and they go and they run around the other side of the tree trunk before you get near them so if you wave your arms around like this and hug a few trees you might scare them back around to where you can see them. And in some places, they're really, really common. Uh, and yet they were completely unstudied. Most of the species didn't have names. And um, they were a wonderful topic for exploration. And so I really started into my PhD with my supervisor really giving me free reign to go in whatever direction I wanted to. And when I first found Chilfina, I was fascinated with them, but we didn't know anything about them. And so I really enjoyed exploring different aspects of their ecology, their behavior, their taxonomy, their morphology, and they're a really fascinating group. However, I'm not gonna be talking about them today because after working on Chilfina and having a PhD and a postdoc in Sydney, I moved across to Aotearoa to the University of Auckland. And when I moved there, everybody said, what are you moving to New Zealand for? There's, there's hardly any mantids there. We only have two species there and one's invasive. So um, I just brought, uh, broadened things out and diversified and started working on a range of other things because a big theme with uh, where I like to kind of start with research is really just getting out into nature, finding interesting things, letting the animals themselves um, kind of raise the questions and uh, put forward the hypothesis for me because um, I get that inspiration from the things that I find in the field rather than being driven by theory. So what I wanted to do today was really kind of talk about one of the themes of my research area um, and share a handful of stories uh, based on the research that my lab group has been working on over there on a few different groups of New Zealand fauna. Um, I hope you find them interesting. They're not heavily theory driven. They're little kind of snapshots of natural history um, that have been converted via uh, hypothesis driven science into evolutionary biology, behavioral ecology, and those sorts of things. So from early on, I was really fascinated with how uh, males and females of a wide range of different animal species can look very, very different. So you see this strong level of sexual dimorphism um, across the animal kingdom. And we see it across a range of different features. And a lot of these different things that you see between males and females are driven by sexual selection. Not all of them, but a lot are. So sexual selection became a topic that I became very fascinated with. And two of the things that I'm particularly fascinated with is how sexual selection can drive complexity, but also how it can drive diversity. So 
Firstly, it can drive complexity. We look at something like this peacock spider here and you have this extraordinarily elaborate coloration and courtship display that males use uh, to court females. And it's, it's exquisite. They raise up this kind of flange on, its, on their back with these iridescent colors and have a lot of dancing around, a lot of drumming, a really complex, complex set of signals that they use to, uh, to court females. The other type of trait that's under sexual selection, as, um, as aside from ornaments, like we saw in the peacock spider, are weapons, which can also be very heavily dimorphic, such that in many species, it's only the males that possess these structures. So something incredibly complex and elaborate and large like this uh, rhinoceros beetle horn. So you can get complexity driven by sexual selection through uh, female mate choice, as in with peacock spiders, or through male-male competition uh, with animal weapons like this. So complexity can be driven by se sexual selection. The other thing it can do is it can drive diversity because there are lots and lots of peacock spiders out there and all of them have different patterns and different dances and different combinations of courtship traits that they use to, uh, to court females. So as well as creating this incredible complexity, it happens on different trajectories among different species within a closely related group. And it's the same with weapons. We look at animal weapons across a range of different scarab beetles here. You can see that they're all big, they're all enlarged, they're all complex and exaggerated, but they've all taken different paths. So you get this generation of diversity by sexual selection as well. So if you were to kind of sum up my kind of theoretical interest that we will focus on, it is how does sexual selection influence morphological structures and drive their diversity? Um, but as I said, I'm a naturalist. Most of what I'm going to present is really based on things that I've seen in nature or my students have observed and things we just wanted to follow to see where they went. So with that in mind, I really want to raise, before I go any further, uh, the huge contribution that all of these students have made to what I'm going to present. Uh, they've been my PhD and master's students working on these topics. Uh, they all did phenomenal work um, that I'm incredibly proud of, and um, I'll kind of talk about some of their stories as we go. So I'm going to start with the New Zealand giraffe weevil. So the New Zealand giraffe weevil is our only Brentine weevil in New Zealand. It is a spectacular animal, it's our longest beetle, but we do have similar species here in uh, the Queensland rainforest. Has anybody seen relatives of these guys around? Excellent. I'd love to find out if you know where I could search for some, because um, there's a lot of relatives of these guys all over the world, but we only have one in New Zealand. So that's the one we studied. Um, and it got started very much with the work of Chrissy Painting, who's now on the faculty at University of Waikato. So giraffe weevils are fascinating because of their morphology. Um, we can see a large male uh, atop there, and you see that he's got an incredibly elongated rostrum uh, with a bit of a moustache running down underneath it. And underneath there, you see a female who also has uh, an elongated rostrum, but not to the same extent. Um, and she's using it for the function that she has, which is to bite and chew away and create little holes into the bark of decaying trees, logs, that she'll then lay eggs into. He's there because he's waiting for the right moment. Um, if she's willing, he'll mate with her and then fertilize her eggs so that he can, uh, he can pass on his genes that way. So, this giraffe weevil is a really fascinating looking creature and we're interested in finding out a little bit more about what's going on with this elongated nose in the males. So here's a little video clip that should show you a little bit about what's going on with the male rostrum. So they've been marked with little color marks. That's not their natural colors. Just so we know who's who. So there's a male over the top of a female there and this other male's coming in. So she's lost interest, she's off. <laughs> the males are still fighting it out. Females are never that interested in the fights that males get into. 
That's a truism. There we go. Success for that guy. He's grabbed onto the male, the other one eventually, and flicked him off onto the ground, sometimes from great heights, <laughs> but um, just down at the leaf litter. They tend to not get too harmed from that. They, uh, they get up and climb back up the tree. So the environment's there and can be really quite dynamic. So we saw a nice interaction there with a mating pair and another competing male comes along. It's not uncommon though to find a, a log that might have 20 or 30 or up to 60 different individuals all really dynamically cruising around over the top of one another, a lot of mating, a lot of fighting. So they actually provided a really nice um, setting in which to investigate what's going on in the field. So a lot of the time when people are looking at mate choice, people are looking at competition between males, you kind of have to set things up in a staged way in the lab to get, uh, get nice data. In this context, Christy was able to get out and sit in front of one of these dynamic kind of trees, mark all the individuals so she knew who was who, and then look at what happened associated with matings and fights and things like that. So it looks like this uh, elongated nose of the males might be involved in fighting, maybe under se sexual selection uh, to improve fighting success and therefore improve mating success. So does this hold up? So if we actually look at a range of different fights between two different male giraffe weevils, and we focus on the uh, one particular focal individual within a pair of fighting males, uh, you can then assess whether the um, having a smaller rostrum or a longer rostrum is likely to lead to winning the fight or losing the fight. So in this graph, if we look at, let's go, there we go, this thing, great. If we look in this center point here on the x-axis there, that's denoting a situation where both individuals were basically around the same size. And in that situation, the individual that you're looking at could lose or they could win pretty similar sort of chances. If your focal individual is a lot smaller or has a smaller rostrum, then there's a much higher chance that they're going to lose. If your focal individual has a longer rostrum, there's a much higher chance that they're going to win that contest. So there's a nice bit of evidence there that having a longer rostrum can uh, allow you to win the fight um, and may potentially then lead on to having higher mating success if you manage to drive off your rivals. But that's a big if. One of the things we also noticed out there is a huge variation in the size of male giraffe weevils, ranging from incredibly small ones that are only about one and a half centimetres long through to very large ones that are about nine centimetres long, really wide size range in adult male giraffe weevils. And so you might end up with a situation like this where you have males fighting it out over access to uh, females or to the tree resource that the females are interested in. Or you might get a situation where if you're a small giraffe weevil, you're probably not gonna stand much of a chance in any of the fights that are going on. So perhaps there's another strategy that you can use. And what this lovely drawing from Emma Sheltimer shows is exactly that. Here you'll see is a little male giraffe weevil sneaking in under the very nose of this large male giraffe weevil here and mating with the female underneath. And this is something that happens. So small males will use this sneaking mating behavior. They don't try to engage in fights with larger uh, rivals. They instead try to sneak in underneath those uh, larger males. So when we look at sneaking behavior, um, again, it's very size dependent. So we saw previously that males with larger rostra are more likely to win fights. In this situation, we're looking at the probability of using a sneaking strategy. And in this case, if you are much smaller than um, your rival, you're much more likely to engage in sneaking rather than fighting. So the probability of sneaking is up high. Oops, sorry, wrong button. Probability of sneaking uh, is almost 100% when there is a big difference between you and your rival being a whole lot bigger. So if you turn up and there's a big rival, you'll engage in sneaking rather than fighting. The interesting thing though, is that even the little guys will fight if their rival is also small. 
So it's a flexible tactic that they can use. They're not just switched on to being fighters or sneakers. They can flexibly use that strategy. But the really big guys never use sneaking because they never really encounter a situation where they're going to be able to sneak underneath another individual because they're just too big. So a really interesting pattern there. So all in all, you've got these two different strategies. Males can either fight to try to drive away their rivals or they can sneak in uh, and try to get around their rivals, which is actually more successful. So this is where um, Bexley Bryce, who's now at Canterbury Museum, um, did her uh, master's work. And she went out and she monitored a lot of these giraffe weevils over a much longer period of time than we had done previously, over a number of uh, weeks to months. And she monitored how often different individuals uh, mated. So we're interested here on whether sexual selection overall was driving the evolution of the rostrum, all these different strategies. And what she generally found was that larger weevils did get to mate more often. So the little guys use this sneaking strategy, but it's not as successful overall as the strategy of fighting off your rivals when you're large. Um, she also found that larger females actually mated more as well. So perhaps males are actually competing more over the opportunity to mate with larger females. Perhaps they're more fecund, perhaps they're um, an overall a better resource uh, for those males. Interestingly, through that data of looking at uh, giraffe weevils over such a long time, she was also look at, able to look at their lifespan. How long did they live for? Because they tended to have quite high fidelity on the tree that they were on and basically found that um, the observed lifespan of individuals was longer for larger individuals. So this is also very interesting when it comes to sexual selection because often we think that when an animal invests in a trait that is quite complex or quite expensive, then it might come at some cost. So we kind of predicted that maybe the larger individuals weren't going to actually live for as long because they were out there fighting a lot. They'd already put a lot of their energy into growing this big long rostrum. But it turned out to be the opposite. We found that the large individuals were living longer as well. So there's two reasons why being small, even if you've got that sneaking strategy to use, is not so great. You don't get as many matings and you don't live as long. So some interesting aspects of these giraffe weevils uh, altogether. There's a lot more to this story, but I just wanted to share a few uh, features before I move on to something else. So there's something else, are uh, our cave wetter. So cave wetter are uh, in the family of Rifidophoridae. They're um, in other parts of the world, they're called cave crickets or camel crickets. Uh, within Aotearoa, we call them cave wetter, but they are in a separate family to the other groups of wetter, like giant wetter and um, tree wetter and ground wetter within New Zealand as well. So cave wetter are fascinating. They're also found in these really dynamic um, populations where if you go into a cave system and you look up on the ceiling, there could be hundreds of them all gathered around hanging from the ceiling there. They're a really fascinating group um, to work on. So um, with the help of Murray Fee, one of my PhD students, um, we started getting interested in cave weather to find out what was going on. So there's Murray in one of these caves setting up uh, a whole lot of these um, infrared trail cams to put down in those caves, look straight up and monitor everything that was going on with the cave wetter on the ceiling to see what was happening. So we were interested in the fact that if we go back a little, that male cave wetter, all the cave wetter have really long legs. That's just a, a cave wetter thing. Um, but we did notice that the males had much longer legs than the females in this species, Pachyrama whitanoensis. So we started out with this idea that perhaps they're using them as a weapon, just like the giraffe weevil rostrum. So we wanted to find out if that was the case. And yes, that was. So they did fight a lot, males, and they would use their legs in those fights. They would start out with more of a just kind of flailing their legs around kind of approach to fighting one another. Um, and if things progressed, they would actually back up against one another and really push with their legs against one another to try to push them off, push their rival off the cave ceiling or the cave wall. So Murray found exactly the same sort of pattern as we did for giraffe weevil rostra. If you have larger, longer legs than your rival, you're more likely to win a fight against them. So that seemed to be suggestive of what was going on. But Murray also noticed that 
they seem to engage in this mate guarding. Like we saw in the giraffe weevils, but they were often there for very long periods of time and they would often mate with the females multiple times when they were engaged in this mate guarding. So Murray wanted to find out whether maybe having longer legs also gave them some advantage in mate guarding. So to start with, he found that when males were guarding these females, the longer period of time that they spent guarding a female, the more times they got to mate with her. So these aren't an insect where they mate once and then they part ways. In this situation with mate guarding going on, they can mate up to 10 times before they go in different directions. We found that the longer that they were there uh, guarding a female, the more times they got to mate with those females. So could there be an advantage there to what's going on with the uh, hind legs? Could it help them to guard and allow them to have um, more matings? It seemed like that was probably the case. The spanner in the works there was, though, however, the fact that when a male was guarding a female and another male came along, they would have a fight, but that would pretty much end things and the female would take off in another direction like we saw with the giraffe weevils too. And this happened every time. There was never a situation where a male successfully guarded a female from a rival that intruded upon the situation. So we um, started scratching our heads a little bit about what might be going on. And then Murray looked at some of this footage and through some of his observations that he'd made in the caves. If we look up at the top there, you'll see that the top image, there is a, a pair up here, and there are a whole bunch of juvenile cave wetter and cave wetter from a different species on the ceiling there, roaming around, bumping into them. If we look down at the bottom video, you'll see, wait till it starts again, you'll see this spider cruising on through on the bottom left, and as it walks, everything just starts taking off as it goes anywhere near it, except the male and the female that he's guarding. So Murray put forward this really intriguing hypothesis or this idea that guarding the females might be less about guarding them against rivals and more about giving them a bit of space against all of these constant intrusions that are happening on the cave wall. Because the more we looked at this video footage, the more it was happening all the time. There's constantly spiders roaming through, other species of weta, harvestmen, velvet worms. There was all sorts of things cruising around on the cave wall. And when they bump into cave weta, they run off. And so Murray put forward this idea, if a big male can stand there and kind of stand his ground and deflect all of these intrusions, then the female might stay put and he might have the opportunity to mate with her more often. So how he did this was he took all of the many, many hours of footage that he'd taken and he constructed these kind of diagrams to show the paths of different intruding organisms other species of cave weta, spiders, all sorts of things, juveniles of Pacarema, as they roamed around, and how close they got to uh, solitary female cave weta. So right in the middle there, just seeing a diagram of a solitary female cave weta, and these lines show how often these intrusions bump into females. And when that happens, the female runs away. What happens when there's a guarding male? The guarding male defends that female from those intrusions. So here we see a diagram showing a male guarding a female, and you can see that all of those uh, nuisance organisms, is what Murray called them, uh, were bumping off the male and taking a different path rather than scaring the female. So did, that, did this actually kind of make a difference to those females? Well, we found that disturbances per minute, if we plot that on the y-axis here, the disturbances per minute were um, much, much lower in guarded males than in unguarded males. And even males that only had a single hind leg that were guarding a female managed to defend off intruders in that way as well. What about the size of the male's legs? So Murray, in this time, plotted the size of the male's hind legs against the number of nuisances that came along uh, per actual disturbance to a female. And what this plot shows is that if males have longer legs, then they're better able to deflect more of these nuisances without the female getting disturbed. So not only does the guarding behaviour itself kind of protect the female from disturbance, 
if you're a male and you invest in longer legs, you can do a better job of that. Murray then took it a little bit further and also wanted to demonstrate this experimentally because this was all based on footage of a wild population. So this time what he did was he took pinned specimens of male and female cave wetter, arranged them on the cave wall as they normally sit the guarding pair, and then looked at the rate of intrusion by these intruders into the female space. He found that when he took smaller males, or males with smaller legs and males with longer legs, then he was getting the same pattern in these pinned specimens. He then kind of took a Frankenstein approach and he made cave wetters with extra long legs, longer than you would actually find in nature, and ones with extra short legs, shorter than you would find in nature, and showed uh, a further disparity in that kind of pattern. So altogether, some really, really nice evidence there from Murray's work to suggest that having longer legs, as well as allowing males to win fights against rivals, they also have a real benefit for mate guarding, allowing males to get more matings with those females and preventing them from getting disturbed. I'm gonna have a brief segue here. I'm not gonna to present too much about these guys, but there are more recent uh, study group that we've been focusing on. Um, the Neopileonoid harvestmen are a group of arachnids that have diversified quite a lot in New Zealand, right across the country. There are a number of different species. So harvestmen are sometimes called daddy long legs. Um, you have uh, species locally around here. Um, they're reasonably diverse worldwide, but they're a group that hasn't had a huge amount of study that they're a fascinating group. And what really grabbed my attention when I started seeing these out in the field was these enormous jaws that the male harvestmen have. So it suggested to me that they're likely to have some um, form of sexually selected weapon, like I've already talked about with these other species. So we wanted to find out a little bit more about them, but we're very much uh, in our infancy of discovering uh, a little about our New Zealand harvestmen. But I just wanna emphasize a really fascinating pattern is that some species of these harvestmen have incredibly elongated jaws. So if we look up here, you can see that this is like a, almost like a construction crane kind of process where the jaw is elongated right out and has an elbow at the end and it just unfolds its jaws like that. It's really, really extreme looking animals. Some of them have shorter chelicera but they are really, really broad, full of muscle, really powerful structures, a bit like fiddler crab claws, really, really strong structures like that. You can see where they are on this guy, just on this end here. So this is the front of the face, that's the jaws enlarged out as well. What I find really fascinating though, is that you get both of these forms of jaw in the same species, in the same population males roaming around with either incredibly exaggerated jaws that are going out really long like a construction crane or these big short um, fiddler crab claw kind of jaws. Both same species, same population and interacting out there in the field. So this is a pretty unique phenomenon because not only do we have these two morphs, we also have a third little miniature morph of male that has chelicera that are the same size as what you find in females, just little feeding apparatus for getting food into the, into the mouth. So we have a trimorphism. So rather than a dimorphism, which is what you sometimes find in things like dung beetles, where you get separation into minor or major males, we've got this separation from minor males, and then you can be major in two different ways, which is really quite extreme. And they use them both in different ways when they fight with one another. The elongated ones just flail them around and try to just knock at each other. Um, the ones with the short, broad uh, chelicera are actually really punching out with them. They're getting in close and really kind of giving their opponent a big whack. So really amazing animals. We've, um, they're really hard to observe. We haven't built up the sort of uh, behavioral data set we'd like to so far because they don't seem to want to play ball when you sit and watch them. Um, but I think there's going to be a lot of really interesting stories to tell uh, about these harvestmen. So I'll just leave it at that. How are we doing for time? Just at the clock for me. I think I'm doing all right. <clears throat> so I just want to finish with a, a slightly different kind of story. So 
This time we're going to be focusing on this beautiful group of endemic New Zealand moths, the genus Azatha, beautifully camouflaged. They're called lichen tuft moths. You find them on lichen itself, but even when they're just sitting out on their own, they just kind of look like a little tuft or a little sprig of lichen. Um, really lovely creatures, quite diverse. We've got about 40 or so species uh, in New Zealand. Um, and aspects of their coloration and the camouflage, uh, other stories and other interesting features of them. But what I want to focus on today is that as well as being these beautiful, lovely little moths, they also have these extraordinarily complex genitalia. So we talked earlier on about how ornaments and weapons can be incredibly complex, but same is true for animal genitalia. It's particularly so for the male genitalia of all sorts of different animal groups but it's starting to get more data to suggest that female genitalia are also similarly diverse. So they can be incredibly complex, but like with the ornaments and the weapons, they can be incredibly diverse too. So here are a couple of different genital structures found within Azatha, um, but you'll see there's a lot of diversity in their shapes, their sizes, the degree of sclerotization, and whether or not they even possess some particular features that are absent in some and found in others. So genitalia are complex and they're diverse, and that's what we kind of expect to see amongst structures that are under sexual selection. And a lot of the work over the last 30 years or so, looking at the evolution of genitalia has demonstrated that sexual selection can be a strong driver of genital structure. One of the reasons for that is that in some groups of animals, the male genital structures can be harmful. So we look at a structure like this, this is the phallus from a species of Azatha, and we see it's highly sclerotized and it has these backward curving spines on the genital structure there from the male. So it's suggestive that it might be one of these harmful genital structures. People had researched uh, these sorts of phenomena in things like seed beetles and bed bugs and various other insects, and there's a good growing evidence that harmful genitalia are actually really common across the animal kingdom. So is this what's going on with Isartha? Well, my PhD student, Rebecca Benick, did some really lovely morphological work on Isartha. And she found that when we look at species of Isartha where they don't have these phallic teeth over here, so these, where they look like this and they're rather smooth on the outside, when you look at females that either haven't mated with a no or they have mated with a yes, you see that there is no evidence of any kind of damage. So here on the, on the y-axis, we're talking about the area of the female reproductive tract that shows some evidence of damage or scarring. If we look at species of Azatha that have these spines, however, we'll see that if you compare females that haven't mated, they still have no damage, but the ones that have mated have differing degrees of damage that seems to correlate with the size and shape of the spines of those males. So there seems to be some suggestion here that Isartha genitalia, in ma the male genitalia, are harmful. So one of the patterns that people have found looking at the evolution of genitalia is that there's often strong co-evolution between male and female genital traits. And this could be for a variety of reasons. But when you have a harmful male trait like this, in other groups, people have found that females respond to defend themselves against that harm by producing genital traits, internal traits that reduce that sort of damage. So Rebecca decided to look at the thickness of the reproductive tract wall in the females where the male genitalia come into contact. And she found that when we look across species, so each one of these dots is a different species of Isartha. And if we look at the y-axis, we're looking at the length of the phallic teeth on males of that species. And the x-axis is looking at the thickness of the female ductus bursa, the female reproductive tract. And you'll see that there's an incredibly tight correlation between those traits. The more spiny and harmful the male genitalia for a species, the more defended the female genitalia are to be able to cope with that. So this is really nice um, evidence for co-evolution between the male and female genital traits. But wait, there's more. If we look at Isartha male genitalia, some species don't have much in the way of external phallic teeth, 
But when you look inside, they have this barrage of darts. And when the male mates, they eject these sclerotized darts into the female reproductive tract. Bizarre. So if we look at a dissected female reproductive tract, you see this is the opening, the male inserts his phallus, gets to about here, and that's where these darts are ejected out into the female reproductive tract there. So it seemed to be, again, another one of these, what looks like a very harmful trait, uh, just dropping a big <laughs> bomb of explosive darts into the female seems to be a strange thing to do. However, we were interested in whether they might, females might also have some trait that could counter this. If you look up where these darts are deposited, there is also this interesting feature in the female tract, and that's called a signum. So the darts themselves are called deciduous cornuti. They're commonly found across a range of different moths and butterflies. And the feature in the female, this feature here, which is like a sclerotized plate, is called a signum, and it's also common across moths and butterflies. So we started to wonder, is there perhaps some coevolution going on between the deciduous cornuti in the males and the signum in the female? And once again, there was. So we have situations like down here where their males do not produce cornuti and the female either doesn't have a signum or has a very small one. And then further up here, we have situations where there is a female signum, there are male deciduous cornuti, and the size of those structures correlate. We look at the number of deciduous cornuti being ejected by males, which varies from one species to the next, there's also that correlation. So some species can eject, can eject nearly 40 of these darts, and some it's only a few. But again, there's a correlation. When the female has a larger signum, the males eject more of these cornuti. When we plotted this out over a phylogeny of the group and looked at the evolution of the deciduous cornuti on this phylogeny here, shown in purple whenever there are any cornuti being produced by males, and on the right-hand side, the branches of the tree are shown in orange where there is a female signum. We'll see that there is some degree of coevolution co between the two. There are a lot of clades and branches where there is both deciduous cornuti and a signum. But what this phylo uh, phylogenetic approach really showed us was that the signum appears to have evolved first because there are branches to this phylogeny where the uh, signum has evolved in females, but the males don't possess deciduous cornuti. So the analyses seem to suggest that perhaps this is a big perhaps, we need to do something experimental to really try to figure this out, I think, is that the female signum has evolved for some other function. The males have co-evolved to produce these cornuti in response to that signum. Now, what could that function be? In other butterflies and moths, it's been now demonstrated that the female signum is used to break apart the male spermatophore to release the sperm for fertilization. And in some species, breaking apart the spermatophore um, then leads on to the female digesting those sperm and not using them. So it's a big jump to say whether or not that's happening in Isartha or not, because we haven't demonstrated that. But it seems to fit the story. Perhaps the females evolved this signum to break apart the male spermatophore. This was not such a good thing for the males. They've co-evolved to produce these spines that they eject into the female reproductive tract to perhaps stop that female from grinding around that signum over the spermatophore, because perhaps that process might damage them through the, the presence of these cornuti. So there's a lot of arm waving there. I acknowledge that, <laughs> but it's kind of an interesting possibility, and it's a hope, hypothesis that we can perhaps test further. If I can get a student maybe to start looking at um, the function with, of the signum with the spermatophore and, and maybe the coevolution with the spermatophore as well. So there's a lot that we could do to take that a bit further. So that's all I've got. I finished a little bit early, but I just want to thank you all for being here. Here's a bunch of acknowledgements. Um, I want to acknowledge my family uh, and Leo and Hazel. 
Um, if we kind of didn't do all of this as a team, I wouldn't be able to do the interesting things that I get to do. So uh, having them join me on our adventures, including the one that we're on right now, um, is part of the, uh, the fun of it all. But I also have a lot of collaborators and students there to thank, um, as well as the, the Marsden Fund, the New Zealand Royal Society um, funding body that has funded the research on the um, uh, Isartha moths, as well as the Harvestman work, which is ongoing. Um, but I want to thank all of you guys for being here. I'm Anne and I are here for yeah for the next six weeks or so. We're excited to be back in the tropics um, and yeah very keen. If anybody's interested to, to interact more, chat with any of you, any of the students of that out there would like to talk about your research projects, I'd be delighted to hear about them. Um, and particularly if anybody's got some nice suggestions for um, getting out and seeing some wildlife, places to go see some birds, do some spotlighting, other cool insects that you might have seen around that you can show me. So yeah, we're really keen to do that. We're around and happily available to spend time in the field over the next uh, five or six weeks. So yeah, thanks very much everyone.